It's a topic that's become as American as apple pie and fireworks, the legendary LS swap. Now let's face it, in the land of the free where you're at liberty to pursue your automotive dreams, LS swaps reign supreme. LS swap the world, right? With unbeatable bang for your buck and a mountain of aftermarket support, the answer to how do I go fast on a budget is almost always the same. But I'll let you in on a little secret. LS swaps don't exactly light my fire. Yeah, I said it. With so many going this route, it's hard for me to personally get excited. But that doesn't mean I won't recommend it when a customer asks, what can I do to hit a thousand horsepower for the best value? Welcome back gearheads to Fluid Motor Union's weekly installment where we dive into the world of high performance builds, luxury repairs, and all things automotive. I'm OJ Lopez, the owner and lead technician here at Fluid Motor Union in Naperville. Today we're answering requests to comments and taking you through a little build that a lot of you have seen hiding in the background of some of our videos. But before I do that, you need to hit the like button if you want us to keep putting forth effort and resources into making better automotive content for you to enjoy. And if you want more wide ranging automotive repair, performance and fabrication builds, hit the subscribe button to see unique vehicles that roll through here every week. Now we've done a lot of LS swaps, big power builds, crate turnkey motors, LS and imports and off-road vehicles, and even 40s hot rods. So today we're taking you through the process of answering that 1000 horsepower question for our customer. So stick around because this isn't just another five things you need to know before you swap your LS. We're going to show you what FMU has planned to keep this build interesting enough to turn my gears and have our customer stand out in an ocean of LS swaps. All right, so let's talk LS swaps. I get asked all the time on Instagram and YouTube, how do you do an LS engine swap or how much does it cost? Well, the truth is it's a loaded question because every project is different. But I'm gonna give you the lowdown on what you need and what to expect using this Chevelle as a prime example to showcase the process. This customer came to us with a camshaft that was disintegrating after a high compression full rebuild of his big block at another shop. Metal shavings around the lifters, multiple worn camshaft loads, and heavy wear on the cylinder walls all pointed to one eventual outcome, a full rebuild of his 454. The main issue is that a rebuild would only resort in restoring the intended power which was questionable with an iron heads, 13 to one pistons, and a camshaft that wouldn't even stay together. With heavy damage to the crank and other engine components, the price to get this thing back together was quickly approaching a lighter, more modern setup, which of course would be an LS. First things first, you need a car and you need an LS engine. Generally, there are two types of LS engines, car and truck. Yes, I understand that most of the truck engines aren't formally designated LS, but you all understand, so there's no reason to run to the comments. For our Chevelle, we opted for a 5.3 truck engine. Why? Because these engines are workhorses and with the right modifications, they can deliver insane power, especially for the price. We rebuilt and blueprinted our 5.3, making sure the ring gap was perfect to handle the boost from a massive turbocharger. The goal, a cool 1,000 horsepower when set to kill. Now let's talk about budget. If you've got deep pockets, an LS3 crate engine is an easy choice for a starting point, but you can get big horsepower from a 5.3 truck engine for the fraction of the cost, especially if it's got an iron block. When it comes to an LS, the sky's the limit and the ceiling is what you wanna spend. So honestly, we think that even with the recent rising of prices, a junkyard engine is hard to beat. But the key is finding a good used engine. The best case scenario, a complete dropout with all the accessories so you're not chasing down parts. 
Otherwise, be prepared to spend a bit more piecing it out. So a big part of controlling the budget of his car was using some of the parts that he had, including his transmission. Now, his transmission is a 700R4. Now, most Chevy small blocks will bolt up to most Chevy transmissions. So while that allows us to use the engine that we wanted to use, the big hurdle was going to be a lot of the mounting systems that are available for the swaps on these cars aren't exactly plug and play at that point. So while you can get mounts that drop your LS motor directly into a Chevelle, there's a lot of little differences between what model you might have if you had a big block going to an LS, if you had a small block going to an LS, a V6 going to an LS, all of those mounts are different, and depending on the transmission, that spacing is going to be different. Now, because we wanted the transmission in the exact location, the mounts that we got had to be modified slightly. So, some of the plates we had to make, some of the plates we had to redrill. So, it more or less has a custom setup. This might be something that you have to take into consideration when putting your LS, depending on which transmission you're going to use. But because this thing had a trans brake and he uses it for drag racing, we wanted to keep that the same. So the trans brace location has remained unchanged. As you can see, he's got the drive shaft loop in there in case it breaks. Again, not something we wanted to reinvent the wheel on. So it was really a big matter of getting the LS in this same exact location, which takes us to our next point which is oil pan. Now, there were a lot of different choices for oil pans for the LS motor. There's a lot of aftermarket stuff that's available for the LS motor. And until you have your engine block in place, you might not know exactly what's gonna fit. This rear sump is actually less common on most LS swaps. This part kit that we actually ended up going is called the LS swap kit which has a rear sump, but the part number is actually off of a Hummer H3, and that allows us to clear the trans brace, or excuse me, meet up with the trans brace and clear the cradle here for the engine pretty, pretty nicely. But like I said, a lot of the height difference we had to play with in the motor mounts to get this thing lined up and positioned where we wanted to. So you're gonna to have to keep that in mind too when doing your LS swap. It's not just a matter of buying the parts and dropping your motor in. Depending on what you have, there could be a lot of playing around, a lot of ordering parts, returning them, or even modifying your own. So keep that in mind when you go to do yours. Now when it comes to the headers, that's another rabbit hole. Long tube, shorties, mid-length. It all depends on your setup and budget. And we've used everything from budget headman headers to pricier hooker options. Now, as long as they fit and flow well, you're golden. But in our case, we're a fab shop and there's a ton of turbo manifold options available. But if it doesn't scream high level exhaust fabricators when the hood opens, what's the point of us even doing the build? We build everything you see here in stainless as well as the turbo mounting. And the goal was to have it look intimidating and technical. And we think it does the job. Undoubtedly, the most exciting part for you guys about this build is going to be the S488 turbocharger in this car. Now, this thing should be good for well over a thousand horsepower. We're gonna need more than 20 pounds of boost to get that going. And as you can see, this isn't just a straight kit that we dropped in here. All of this has been custom fabricated by Fluid Motor Union. What I wanted to do with this turbo setup is really have it be the centerpiece of the build to show off kind of what's in here right away when you pop the hood. So we've got it mounted up front here and we've got a mid-length turbo manifold sweeping up over the top, really mostly for show. Could we have swept them underneath? There was enough room, but it doesn't look as cool unless they're sweeping up and you can kind of see 
the waste gates, the plumbing, the V-bands, all of that just adds to the feel of the vehicle, the styling, even though it is performance-based. I like running primaries with turbo manifolds. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, log style. Uh, however, while using a four into one can be a little laggier compared to running a log manifold, the benefits will more or less outweigh the negatives once this thing starts building boost. It's mostly about showmanship at this point. Any manifold we use are going to make power. However, this setup really looks the part of what we're trying to accomplish with this muscle car. And then as for the exhaust, again, we want as much excitement as we can possibly give and for me, there really isn't much cooler than having an exhaust dump right out at the side of the vehicle. And you pull up to a light and you got somebody next to you and the thing's just pumping exhaust. You can hear it burbling out the side of the car. There's really nothing cooler. You hear that turbo whine right away. And this is gonna give the most amount of that. No muffling, nothing in there. Turbochargers do a great job of muffling anyway. So, it really won't get too loud until you're really deep into it, but it's probably gonna get pretty loud. And especially with the way we have the wastegates run, you're really gonna hear all of what this thing's trying to put out. And that's really the point. All right, so let's talk about our reasoning behind picking this particular 5.3 truck motor junkyard and what the thoughts were behind it. Now, when it comes to the LS motors, they all actually end up being pretty stout and can take a lot of power if you build them right. There's lots of stories of people pulling junkyard motors out, throwing boosts at them, and making crazy amounts of horsepower. Now, this is one of those times where you guys got to really do your research. And one of those resources that is phenomenal, if you guys are thinking about starting out, is Richard Holdener, who runs a YouTube channel. And he has so much dyno testing and his Big Bang series on the various LS motors, other V8s, and even some four-cylinder Hondas offer real-world application of what you can do just by building these motors properly. And the secret behind it, a lot of times, is ring gap. So obviously we tore this thing down to the bare block, had it checked, sent it out, and really went over the valve train, camshaft profile of what we picked, and set up the ring gap that's going to allow these things to make enough power, not have those ring gaps close up and cause issues with either the pistons breaking or the rods bending. Um, like I said, check his channel out. He's got some of these five threes with just ring gap. Some of these four eights doing 1,000, 1,200 horsepower. And it's amazing what these things can take, but it really depends on the setup. So this car, the main goal for the customer was for him to be able to say it has 1,000 horsepower. Now, this car has some various mods that when it had that giant heavy big block in it, iron block, iron heads, um, it went to the track, laid down some high 11s, but his goal isn't, you know, world shattering quarter mile times, although if he can get into the sub 10 second area, I'm sure he'd be pretty happy, but that's not the point of the car. He wants to be able to say, this car has a thousand horsepower. And the way we're going to achieve that is with a big blower, a properly set up motor, and probably running E85 and a kill tune that basically allows the E85 to cool the engine, to run properly, to run the timing we need to hit that thousand horsepower mark. But on your everyday running around, you know, just wants to show people, you know, have a six, seven hundred horsepower pump gas tune that sounds cool that 
looks crazy when you pop the hood and he wants to do it for the best value. So that is why when you're thinking about doing an LS swap, do you really need to go with the LS3, the LS7, um, some of these higher end crate motors while having that reliability of the factory warranty behind it can give you a lot of peace of mind. If you know what you're doing, if you played around with these enough, these things will handle the boost that you throw at them if you set them up properly. So our choices for this thing, 5.3 truck motor. We went with a LS6, I believe, intake manifold that's been ported. Um, that's gonna allow us to get the airflow we need. The cam is a Truck Norris Stage 2, I believe. Um, that's gonna allow the boost levels we want, but also give it the torque that we need to move this heavy car around. Um, the valves, the valve springs, and the lifters and rockers were all redone in order to allow for more valve lift of the cam to allow this thing to rev up a little bit higher, to take advantage of the manifold, to be able to push a little bit more boost in at the higher RPMs. And really from there, it's a mix match of how we get this on, being the water pump has to be compact. So we had to go with a Corvette water pump. That's one of the most compact, shortest distance water pump set is available out there that's allowing us all this room up front for cooling and the turbo system that we want to run some of the bigger uh, water pump housings are going to come out a lot further that would make this a lot tighter which we don't want we really wanted to get the turbo up front here um, 93 millimeter throttle body we're going drive by wire on this um, gonna run it into a factory ECU. I'll get into more about that later. Uh, but basically, that's our plan for getting this version in. And like I kind of said previously, LSs typically don't excite me too much. So we kind of have to think about how we can get this LS to look like Fluid Motor Union did it. So you can see I've got the coil packs mounted on top. That's gonna to give it a more intimidating look when I'm running the wires out and down. The other thing that I think is a little bit different, a lot of people don't run. LS motors come with timing chains and timing chains, they're great, they're reliable, but for a little bit more theater, we've decided to go to a geared setup. Now, the big drawback with a geared setup is that they make a lot of noise. Now, there's also two modes that are available out there, and they're actually kind of hard to find companies that offer geared setups as opposed to the timing chain. Now, because they make more noise, there's really just an option of having a loud timing chain or a louder timing chain. This car's all about presentation it's all about style and look and the one way you could tell right away this thing's running 24 inch donk wheels which really aren't the best for drag racing however he does have a set of street slicks and wheels when he wants to go but at the end of the day this car is more about the image being able to say he has a thousand horsepower the sound the turbo is going to make the sound the v8 is going to make but we're adding a different layer of there of a mechanical whine coming from the geared setup, which just should add to the street presence of the car. And like I said, this combination, I think is really gonna give the customer what he's asking for. Wiring up the engine is where things can get tricky. You could go the DIY route and modify a stock harness, or you could buy a standalone setup complete. We opted for a stock PCM as we have extensive experience tuning these with HP tuners and the diagnostics of a stock setup are familiar to us. And if there's an issue down the road, well, if it ain't broke, 
don't fix it, right? Now, it's not the most bestest option, no, but it's definitely one of the best for diagnostics and value for tuning flexibility. Like I said, we're familiar with it, so going ahead and using something that we know is going to work is the quickest way for us to get the customer what he's looking for when value is the main goal. Now, as you can see, this guy here is a modified stock harness. There's a lot of great options out there right now for harnesses set up for this. The only problem is there's so many connections inside of here that you really got to have a good reputation from wherever you're buying these from if you do do that because nothing really ever works as good as OE. And if you're going with someone who built it from scratch, well, you have all these little connections, every wire, you kind of have to trust that that thing's gonna work when you plug it in, which is why standalone units that come complete are usually the best option if budget's not an issue. But like I said, I love the diagnostics of stock. It offers a great bang for your buck value. And with this customer, trying to keep this car within budget, that's what we're going with. So where do we go from here? What do we still have to finish for this customer? Now, as you can see, I don't have the wiring harness on this car yet. However, I'd really like to get the car running in this form, hear the engine start, hear everything kick off as our next step now that we have all the subsystems in place. The big thing that was stopping us was turbo placement because we knew we'd have to modify the cooling system in order to move around the turbocharger. So the next step is sealing up this turbo, sealing up the cooling system, running those lines to where they need to go in order to get this car started, make sure everything's set. And then we're going to finish up the intercooling side, which more than likely is going to be an air to water setup that's going to be mounted over the intake manifold. We really want to utilize the space that his old cowl hood provided in conjunction with his 454 and his big carburetor that was sitting up here. That's gonna allow us a lot of room here to make something that really looks unique but is still functional. Plumbing the turbo in from the backside, having the air to water intercooler mount on top of here via the bolts for the fuel rail big pop-off valve that used down into the throttle i think it's going to look very intimidating when you pop the hood and that's really the big point of this car the biggest takeaway here is that there's no one size fits all approach you got to do your own research plan your build and be ready to get your hands dirty this Chevelle SS is a testament to what's possible with the right combination of parts and know-how. But I hope this gives you a solid starting point for planning your own LS swap adventure. Stay tuned for more builds and tips from Fluid Motor Union. And thanks for watching. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon so you never miss an update. Keep those engines roaring, and we'll see you next week.